Two brothers started their own business. It was a repair shop. They were smart, dedicated, and hardworking. And before long, they were successful. It seemed as if they had made it. But a voice inside them wanted something more. A voice inside them wanted something bigger. So they aimed for the impossible because they saw a future that no one else could see. They risked their fortunes, their reputations, and even their lives because they saw greatness in themselves. Years later, those brothers, those Wright brothers, became the first humans to fly. They did the impossible because they looked into the future and they believed in themselves. I believe in the future and I believe in you. It's an honor to be given this floor at TEDx. I appreciate this opportunity to share with you my thoughts and ideas for the future, and hopefully along the way I can make believers out of you too. Okay, show of hands. Who pays taxes? <laughs> okay, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, there'll be a man in a black suit and dark sunglasses waiting for you in the back. Who drives a car? Okay, everybody, right? <clears throat> A lot of you know that when you drive your car, you are in fact paying taxes. There is an 18 cent per gallon federal fuel tax that you pay every time you go to the pump. This tax goes to fund uh, construction and maintenance of the roads themselves. So to most, this should be viewed as a good tax. It's a fair tax because it's essentially a user charge for the roads. The more you drive, the more you pay, the less you drive, the less you pay doesn't matter what tax bracket you're in or how good your tax attorney is. It's simple and elegant. But I'm here to tell you it's flawed, and we need to fix it, and we need to look into the future to do so. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot about the fuel tax, but moreover, I aim to convey a broad message, a message about the future, not a Hollywood future with flying DeLoreans, but a real future. Where we're going, we will need roads. So we need to think about this tax and fix it. Steve Jobs didn't want to build the best computer of today. No, that's easy. He wanted to build the best computer of tomorrow. And not just to beat his competition, but he did it to push himself. John F. Kennedy gave us the infamous 10-year deadline to reach the moon. Had he set that at 20 years, we would have never made it because we would have never pushed ourselves. But because he set the goal at the impossible, we were driven to reach that goal. Michelangelo once said, favorite Ninja Turtle, by the way. <laughs> Michelangelo once said, the greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. I'm an engineer. I design streets and highways. Now, most engineers are real detail-oriented, real nuts-and-bolts type people. And I'm certainly that way, too. I have to be to be good at my job. But I'm also a big-picture guy. Most engineers love to see the trees. Me, I want to see the beautiful forest. In fact, my colleagues back at the nerdery, <laughs> my colleagues often make fun of me for my dreams of the future, a future where we have the Iron Man operating system. Now, if you've seen the movie Iron Man, you might know what I'm talking about. The main character, Tony Stark, he didn't use a computer mouse or a monitor or an archaic 1960s keyboard like we use every day. No, he worked with holograms. Holograms that he could see in 3D. Holograms that he could hold in the palm of his hand. Holograms that he could assemble and literally throw away. Imagine the possibilities of this system in the real world. A mechanical engineer, for example, could have a full-scale model of, say, a motorcycle right there on their desk and, and switch out gears as they need to, or any part and piece, as if it's really there. Thank you, Tony Stark, for showing us the world we could have, the world we should have, the world with holograms. Now, I love Tony Stark. He's so cool. He even has a cool name, Tony Stark. <laughs> and finally, finally, we get a cool engineer in a movie. <laughs> All I had growing up to look up to was MacGyver. <laughs> and you laugh, but I worship the guy. 
I even had the mullet haircut all the way through sixth grade. <laughs> I finally had to get rid of the mullet haircut when my mom figured out that when I was in trouble and she was chasing me, that long hair was easy to catch me from behind. <laughs> and when an angry Italian woman from New Jersey is chasing you, you don't want to be caught, trust me. <laughs> holograms. We should have holograms now, you know? Marty McFly promised me holograms. Can I please be eaten by a giant shark at the movie theater, please? <sighs> holograms are so cool. I think someday if we do actually invent holograms, I think it might just be the end of the world. I think God might look down at us and be like, holograms? They're not going to invent anything cooler than that. And that'll be it. God will just say, that's the end of the world. Somebody kill the lights. But uh, is that my phone? Uh -huh. I thought I turned. I thought I turned this off. Actually, you know what? I have to take this. It'll just be a second. I promise. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I am in the middle of something. Yes, I know who this is. Yes, God. <laughs> yes, jokes about the apocalypse are not funny. Yeah. I just found that out myself, incidentally. <laughs> how'd, how'd you? How'd you get this number, by the way? I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, yes, I know even while indoors, I'm not safe from lightning bolts. I know. I'll, I'll be good. I, I told him not to call me here. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> we all know we aren't called on the phone by God, but we are called. We're called to be the best us we can be. We're all born to do something. Our souls were created to crave something spectacular that we were each meant to do. What does your soul crave? We're all headed to the future, and we're all meant to contribute to getting us there in our own special way. And I'm not just talking about science or engineering, but also art and music and philosophy, leadership. These are the things that make us human. The human race is on the cusp of so many great things just on the horizon. Can you see it? Just on the horizon? Like a rising sun just peeking over? We're almost there. The future, there's so much to get excited about. Another area that seems to be holding us back a lot lately is data. We hear a lot about data storage in the cloud, data download speeds. Well, in a few years, this isn't gonna matter. We are on the verge of a data revolution. We need to be designing for tomorrow's data speeds or we're not gonna to get to tomorrow. We need to future-proof ourselves for a world where data doesn't matter, for a world with holograms. Big picture stuff. I know I keep bringing up holograms a lot, but they just get me so excited. <laughs> I've, I've always loved holograms. Ever since I was a little kid and my dad used to let me stay up late with him and watch Quantum Leap. <laughs> now, he, he's an engineer too, and we both loved Quantum Leap. If you don't remember the show, the main character's best friend, Al, was a hologram. Al could walk through walls, he could walk through people, and even though it was low-budget 1980s special effects, it still managed to tingle my imagination. Holograms. I'm really revealing a lot of my nerdiness here. <laughs> when your two favorite shows are MacGyver and Quantum Leap, you don't get very many dates in high school. <laughs> I still don't know how I managed to trick my wife into marrying me. <laughs> She's regretting that one, I'm sure. And a friend of ours in college had this joke taped up to her refrigerator. What do engineers use for birth control? Their personalities. <laughs> it's not that funny, come on. <laughs> no, I, I joked earlier about my wife regretting our marriage, and it was a joke, by the way. I hope it was a joke. No, she's amazing. She takes care of me and our four boys. Yeah, four. And those boys are just like me. So needless to say, the woman is a saint. But God did throw her a bone recently, and we now have a baby girl. And that girl is just like her. So we have two angels in the house now, still the five of us boys. So like I said, she's a saint. She's my inspiration. When we were dating, if I ever got sick, she would 
she would take care of me. She'd come over with chicken noodle soup. She'd fluff my pillow, the whole nine yards. And I remember thinking, this is great, you know? And then when we, got, when we had kids, it all stopped. <laughs> she said something about she has children to take care of, and I'm an adult and can take care of myself. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> I was busy plotting my revenge. The revenge would come when she got sick, and I'd refuse to take care of her. Oh, I couldn't wait for her to get sick. <laughs> so she finally gets sick, and I'm waiting with bated breath for her to ask for help. And what does she do? She hops out of bed like any other day and takes care of business. She's so tough. She could have pneumonia, and I'd find her in the living room, like kickboxing seven-year-olds or something. <laughs> Me, on the other hand, if I get a cold, I'm calling a priest over for last rites. I'm such a wimp. She's my rock. Who in your life is your rock? Who in your life is your inspiration? Because when you find that person that builds you up, that person that challenges you to be the best you, well, hold on tight. Because we can't do this alone. But I assure you, we can do this. The future, there's so much to get excited about. Cars are getting more and more efficient every day, and some aren't even using gasoline, which means some people aren't paying their user charge, the 18 cents per gallon. And this problem is only going to get worse as we move off of fossil fuels. Are electric cars our answer? Maybe. The problem with electric cars is that batteries just don't work very well. They're 18th century technology. We can't bottle electricity very well but we can make production of electricity mobile. And one way to do that is with hydrogen fuel cells. The typical car today can go 300 miles on a tank of gas. The typical hydrogen fuel cell vehicle of tomorrow can go 300 miles on four kilograms of hydrogen. That's the weight of a gallon of milk. So I envision a world where we could go to the convenience store and, and switch out canisters of, of hydrogen the same way we switch out propane tanks for our barbecue grill. And you could tax these canisters the same way you tax fuel today, but what makes hydrogen really exciting is that it's easy to produce. All you need is electricity and water. We could have outdoor production units right in our own home and never have to go to a pump and never have to pay a tax. And don't worry about electricity either. We're going to have the power we need. We're not going to have data shortages in the future just like, I mean, we're not going to have power shortages in the future just like we're not going to have data shortages. And don't worry about Hindenburgs either. We're not going to have hydrogen explosions on our city streets. Today we drive around with 30-gallon tanks of gasoline, a chemical specifically designed to be as explosive as possible. And cars aren't blowing up today, except in die-hard movies. <laughs> They're not blowing up today and they won't be blowing up tomorrow. So if we're not buying gasoline, how are we going to collect our user charge? Well, I propose we don't collect a fuel tax at all. Instead, we collect a flat rate per mile driven. This can be accomplished by simply self-reporting our mileage when we pay our annual vehicle registration. The average American drives 13,000 miles a year. And let's say you get 25 miles per gallon. This means you're going to pay about $95 a year in federal fuel tax. If we replaced that with a three-quarter cent per mile driven, you'd pay the same $95, but it would be a catch-all for electrics, hybrids, and any future vehicle we haven't thought of yet. Now, will a change like this to our tax system be easy? No, but anything worth doing is usually hard. But nothing is impossible. Not if you put your mind to it. Not if you get the help and prayers from those around you. Not if you set your goal so high that it seems impossible to reach, like going to the moon in 10 years. John Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. How hard was it to go to the moon in 1969? We built a rocket with 7.5 million pounds of thrust to escape the Earth's gravity and inner orbit. Once in orbit, the rocket separated into various pieces and then reassembled for the trip to the moon. Then, with a very specific amount of thrust, it entered into a lunar orbit. Once in orbit, the ship separated again, 
two guys here, one guy here. These two guys went down to the moon. This guy remained in orbit. Bye-bye, Mike. They landed on the moon. They got out. One small step for man, yada, yada, yada. They blasted back off, rendezvoused with Mike, launched back towards Earth, entered the atmosphere at a very specific angle and velocity. We've all seen Apollo 13. We've got heat shields, parachutes, the ocean, helicopters, speeches, parades, history. And they did it all. They did it all with a computer on board that was about as powerful as this calculator. This calculator that I bought for 96 cents. They landed on the moon with this and with this. They did the impossible. They did the impossible. We can fix this tax and there's no time like the present to do it. There's no time like the present. There's no time like the present for writing that book that you've always wanted to write. There's no time like the present for taking that acting class that you've always wanted to take or that dance class. You know who you are. There's no time like the present for starting that new career that you've always wanted to dive into. Well, dive with your eyes closed if that's what you were meant to do, if that's what your soul longs for. Because until we do what we were meant to do, we're never going to have true joy in our hearts. As the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. But the second best time is today. Plant a tree. Challenge yourself to fly. Challenge yourself to go to the moon. Aim for impossible. I thank you for your attention this evening, and I want to leave you with one final thought. Tomorrow is coming. There is nothing we can do to stop it. The only question is, will you be ready for it? Thank you.